Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Kay, and I work uh, in the School of Leadership Development at Google University. Thank you so much for coming to another one of our Leading at Google speaker series. It's my pleasure to inter introduce today Emmanuel Gobio, the author of The Connected Leader. Um, this book was described by one reviewer as the first leadership book for the MySpace generation. And prior to setting up his own consultancy, Emmanuel was director of leadership services at, global, at the global consultancy Hay Group, where he also led the consumer sector practice. For the last 10 years, he has worked globally with clients ranging from Fortune 500 executives to United Nations leaders, helping them develop their impact. Uh, please join me in welcoming Emmanuel Gobio. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here on the Friday at 3.30 when the highway is getting clogged up. It's really kind of you. I am... Um, now, I'm French, for which I apologize. Uh, I, uh, I apologize for the accent. I don't apologize for everything else the French might have done to you once upon a time. I, I was in an event in Asia a few weeks ago, and... Um, I stood up and I said, you know, I'm French, I apologize. I was going to get on to say I apologize for having a strange accent. But at the time I said, I'm, I'm French and I apologize. The whole audience stood up and clapped uh, to say <laughs> thank you. Because apparently we tried to steal the Olympic torch at the time. So whatever the French have done to you, it wasn't me. Uh, I've been living in the UK for 20 years. But if there's anything I say which you don't understand, please tell me to start again. I, um, it's good to be at Google. It's an honor to be here. It's very strange because I have two children. I have a daughter of 10 and a, and a son of six. And when you say to your children, you're going to Google, it's the first time ever they become interesting in your job, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I said to my kids, I'm going to speak at Google. Uh, we went through the usual joke of there's no way, daddy, that you're going to fit into the iMac and da, da, da. And then my little boy looked puzzled. And, uh, and I said, you know, George, what's, what's wrong? You know, there's, there's something. And he said, well, Papa, because they call me Papa, he said, Papa, I've been thinking. And um, he doesn't call it thinking, he calls it talking to his brain. He said, I've been talking to my brain, and I don't get it. Because if Google want to know what you have to say, why don't they just Google it up, he said. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, you know, I kind of thought two things, really. The first one is my son is obviously a genius, but I knew that. The second thing that I thought about was, well, he's got a point, you know, because actually... Most of what I'm about to say is somewhere on the web. I kind of put stuff on my website. If I have a thought one day, I'll just blog it or whatever. So what's the point? What's the point of, of being here? And the only thing that I could think about was, well, actually, if we can make it interactive in some way and, and actually contextualize what I'm about to say so it fits with your world and your experience and actually adds value to you, maybe that'll make up for getting you on the, on the freeway a bit later. So I'm kind of going to talk for about 45 minutes. There'll be time for questions as well. But in the meantime, if you want to say anything, if there's anything that doesn't make sense, if you want to ask a question, feel free to just contribute. But basically, what I, um, I you're going to have to forgive me. There's, I'm going to do something which I do wherever I go. It's more for me than it is for you. But I figured now we've introduced each other, we're friends, so you don't mind helping me out. I have a test I want to give you. Um, I have been giving this test everywhere in the world to probably about 5,000 people or so now um, in all sorts of industries. It's just for my own purpose. I just want to see if you're any different than anybody else. It's an arithmetic test. You guys should be good at that. It's a simple test. Charlotte, my 10-year-old, she can do the test. So it's simple addition, multiple divisions. There is a trick, but I'm going to tell you the trick as well. So I'm going to really help you out. The trick is you don't know how long you have to do the test. I'm just going to give you this sheet. Please don't look at it until everybody has, has got it, because that would be cheating, which is wrong. So I'm going to give you the sheet. Don't turn it around. When I say go, turn it around. Do as many as you can. You just don't know how long you've got, and then we'll see how far you can go. The aim of the test, do as many as you can, as quickly as you can, correctly. Does that make sense? Could you help me out? Could we just pass them along in some way? So don't, don't look at it just yet, because it's that simple that the minute you see them, you can do them in your head. I'll kind of help. I think we've got, we should have enough for everybody, even the people hiding at the back. 
don't look at it just yet. Just don't wait until everybody's got, got theirs, because otherwise it wouldn't be fair. We've got some pens as well. Has everybody got a copy? Do we have any more copies floating about? Yes. They're making their way, I think. <laughs> Don't look at it, please, until I say go. Pens coming. Don't look at it just yet. Not everybody's got theirs. I think we've run out of papers. Have we run out of papers? Oh, we've got one more here. We've got one more. Okay. Are we ready? Everybody's got their pen and paper. The people who have the test, please go. Okay, my daughter would have done about three by now. You should probably be somewhere halfway down the first column because you are very clever people. If you're working alongside, sideways, that's very strange. We should talk later, maybe. If you're working from the bottom, you are amazing people. I'm about to stop you, just so you know. I'm going to stop you in about a minute or so. Well, even less than a minute, in about five seconds. I'm hoping that most of you would have done a column. And please stop. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be collecting them later. Now, question number one. Who's got 10? Who's got 16? The first one, 8 plus 2, who's got 10? Who's got 16? 16 is correct. Who's read the instructions? Okay, now. Okay. If you look at the instruction, now this is the first piece of learning for today. If you remember nothing else out of today, never trust a Frenchman. Okay, that's the, that's the first thing for you to remember. Here is what's happened in this room. Here is what I want to talk about today. What happens in this room, because you're here, you're very successful. Yeah? You're at the top of the world population by way of brain power. That's why you've been selected to work here. You are incredibly successful people who've made it into the world's most successful company. That means that you know how to do things. You do stuff. That's why you get successful, because you've learned to do. You take an action, a decisive action. That's your drive. We call that the achievement drive sometimes in psychology. That need to achieve. So when somebody says to you, okay, come on, hurry up, and by the way, I've got a 10-year-old and she can do the test, da, 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 da. you go, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. I'm better than that. And you do stuff. <laughs> who got 16? People who got 16, put your hands up. Now, those people have read a leadership book. Those people have read a book once upon a time that said to them, look, if you really want to be successful, it's not just about your drive. It's also about your emotion, your self-control, your ability to step back and think, hang on a second. What's going on here? So not only do you get an answer quickly, but you get the right answer quickly, as opposed to getting a lot of wrong answers a lot quicker than anybody else. And these two things, for about the last 50 years or so, I've been the main driver of leadership. Be driven but at the same time have enough emotional intelligence to be able to do something with it. Now, I want to talk about something else today. I want to talk about the third element, which very few people talk about. You see, the thing is, the people who got 16 feel really good right now. And we're about to change that, just, <laughs> just so you know. The people who got 16, I reckon, and I'm not going to ask because it would be unfair, but probably whilst they were doing the test, there was that little bit at the back of their brain that said, <laughs> I reckon nobody else has spotted the trick, and I have. Yeah? Aren't I clever? I've spotted the trick. And everywhere I have been, anywhere in the world, some people get it right. What I, am, what I am yet to meet is anybody who at some stage is about to stand up in the room and say, by the way, everybody, just so you know, I've spotted something in the instruction which not every single one of you might have spotted. And just in case you haven't, because we kind of work for the same company and we all want to get it right, here, it, you know, here is the trick. That never happens. Never happens. My take is, if you want to be a successful leader today more than at any other time, you're going to have to develop an organization where people are prepared to stand up and point out the mistake to their colleagues where people are prepared to be connected to each other. Because the way to get things right today is not just to take an action. It's not just to have self-control, but it's also to have the connections that can actually increase the wealth of results in an organization. So that's what I really want to focus on today. And I want to focus on 
leadership in terms of building those connections. So leadership at every level of the organization, and I want to come back to that. So four things we're going to talk about, and there is the signpost. What is leadership? And I'm going to need your help to define it. Why do we follow? Why do we, as human beings, ever make the decision to follow? What actually engages people? What engages us? How can we get people engaged in an action? And then how can you deliver? How can you make the difference as an individual? Put it this way. How can you get somebody else to do something that you need, which they don't necessarily need, but they feel good about it? That's kind of the idea of, of today. So let's start with the first one. And let me just ask you, what is leadership? Any? Inspiration? Inspiration? Guidance? Guidance? Mm -hmm. Stepping up? Stepping up? Role, model. Role model? Kind of thinking of the overall efficiency of the team. Did you say taking care of the efficiency? Yeah, Just the, team, the, the efficiency of the entire team? Mobilizing people towards a common outcome. You guys got an election coming up. It must be on your, it must be on your mind as to what is leadership. You know? Yeah. So all this idea of kind of getting, you know, taking care of the team, managing to mobilize people. I, I kind of tried to sum it up in, in three ways. By the way, I'm about to do something which I tell every leader I work with never to do, which is ask the audience what they think and then tell them, funny that. I have three things which are just about the ones you've said, even if they bear no resemblance to anything you've said. I'll manage to make it fit. That's what leadership tends to do. But yes, positive engagement. How do we get somebody positively engaged with a goal? It's easy to get somebody to do some things. It's very simple to get somebody to do something. As long as you've got a bigger job title, or you hold the money, or you're the one allocating bonuses or share options, or you've got bigger shoes or a bigger gun, you can get somebody to do something. That's called coercion, and it's fairly straightforward. What we're after is how can we get somebody to do something willingly, positively, so that they give you what we call discretionary effort. Every single one of us wakes up in the morning with an amount of energy. Some of that energy we'll allocate to eating, breathe, eating a lot of energy in eating at Google, free kitchens everywhere. Eating, drinking, engaging, doing the things that we need to do to survive. And then we'll be left at the end of the day with a small amount of energy which we allocate wherever we want. And you and I know that in some work environment we give that discretionary effort. Mihaly Chinchenke Mihaly from Chicago calls it being in flow. You know, the concept of being engaged and lost in your work. So we need to create that positive engagement. That's role number one of the leader. Number two, what I call challenge and support. How do we create challenge and support in other people? The perception, and I don't mean that in a Machiavellian way. I just mean how do we create the perception so that people feel challenged and supported? I mean perception because it doesn't really matter what you think you've done, what matters is what people have experienced. So their perception matters more than what you've done. So that's point number two of leadership. Positive engagement and challenge and support. How do we create that challenge and support? The last one, I think there is something in leadership about the personal risk that people take. Being able to take a personal risk differentiates a leader from maybe a manager. As a leader, you're no longer about keeping stuff going. You're about making a choice. If you want people to follow, you're going to have to stand for something. You're going to have to be prepared to take a personal risk. And for me, these are the, the three points that differentiate. And in none of those points, does it say anything about job title? Does it say anything about role? Leadership is not a role. You know, you can't just make somebody a leader. You might want to give them a job title, but that doesn't make them a leader. So leadership is different from just being a role. And that's what I want to talk to you about next, which is if somebody is a leader, they obviously need somebody to follow. That's kind of otherwise they're just lonely, deluded individuals. So if somebody is going to follow, why do you follow? Why do, why do you make following, follow a ship, as they call decisions? What, what makes you want to follow somebody? Believe in, what believe in what they're doing. If you believe in what they're doing. Inspired. inspired. Challenged. Challenged. Yes, we can. 
that kind of, you know, challenged, being, believing in what they do? Respect for the person. Respect for the person, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the feeling that people are going to succeed, the feeling that they can take you to a place which is a better place and it will actually be a better place, yeah. Again, nothing to do with the role. You know, really two, two things, two things that... Uh, do any of you know, know, know the work of Seth Godin? It's an incredibly hard thing to say for a Frenchman when he's got an S and a TH in the same word. Seth, Seth Godin. Seth does a lot of marketing, written some of the most mar amazing marketing books. I know he came to speak here as well. Um, I, I was looking at the work of Seth to define what, what makes something viral. You know, what makes something become viral on the net or marketing campaign. And Seth says, well, it's really quite straightforward. There's two things you need. One is you need something worth talking about. And then the second thing you need is to make it easy for people to talk about it. And for me, that's kind of the secret of leadership too. Are you worth following? You know, we follow people who we believe are worth following. This bit about, I believe this person is going to take me to the right place. What I call it here is say, look, it's useful to follow them. There is a utility. There is, it's worthwhile for me to follow. This is the precondition to following. There is something in it for me. There's something in it for that person too. The idea of reciprocity. But once... It may be useful to follow somebody, but we can only follow them for as long as they make it easy for us to follow, which is the same thing in part two of Seth's argument about viral. Is, you know, it's worth talking about, but it's also easy to spread. Well, leadership should be easy to spread. And a lot of the time we focus on how useful we are to other people rather than how easy we make it to be followed. You know, are we warm in our relationship? Do we take the time to, you know, engage with people so they're engaged with us? Do we spend enough time showing people that we truly care about what they do? Do we spend the time talking to them and making it easy to maintain if people are working at different corners of Googleplex or even different corners of the world? So all this idea of making it easy to be followed is one that we need to spend more time on. And, and it does matter because it's really about what engages people. What makes us engage in the work? So remember, what we're trying to understand is how do I get people on board with my idea when I haven't got a job title that says they have to? So they're positively engaged. And really, these are my kids. Do you have any children under the age of 12? Are they on Club Penguin? Now forget anything else I'm going to talk about. I'm about to change your life for real. www.clubpenguin.com I never looked that tired before Club Penguin. Club Penguin, for those of you who don't know, just been bought by Disney. Uh, Club Penguin is an online community for children. They go on. They choose a penguin. This is my, my daughter on the left, Charlotte. My boy on the right, George. They choose the color of their penguin. They play games. Every time they play games, they earn coins. With the coins, they go onto the club catalog and buy more stuff for their penguins. So funny clothes and surfboards. My son has got a collection of, of surfboards, and they both have the same mobile phone. But um, now, the reason why I've changed your life is because what happens with Club Penguin is actually the children play on it during the day, and then they say to you, by the way, tonight, could you earn me more coins so I can buy more stuff? So the parents end up playing the games at night to earn more coins for the kids. My advice to you all, if you're about to launch in Club Penguin, pizza. Make pizza. This is what earns the most coin in the simplest sort of way. So I've, again, given you a tip there. Club Penguin is fantastic. The reason it's fantastic is because it tells us about how people engage with other people. My little boy will tell you, Papa, if you log on past 3 o'clock afternoon London time, do not use a US server. 3 o'clock in the afternoon UK time, US servers become really slow because the American kids are getting up. And when they're getting up, they're checking out their puffholes, which are the pets on Club Penguin. So the whole thing goes really slow. <laughs> now, this tells you two things. Number one, my boy is a geek. And that's fine. That's OK. I'm OK. He can work here. I will give you his, he's only six, but he's training. Now, the second thing that it tells you about my son is he has an idea of time differences, which are his, 
age I didn't have. My son will be able to have a conversation with a little boy who happens to live next door and a little boy who happens to live in India, all at the same time. We, we kind of know the one next door is a little boy. We hope the one in India is also a little boy. But I'm told with the security system on Club Penguin, it probably is. So the, the idea of engagement, the idea of communities, is kind of very strange today. I don't know if any of you have come across a, a book called Bowling Alone by Putman from Harvard. Now, it's a great big thick book called Bowling Alone. And Bowling Alone is about you know, 600 pages worth of statistics that make one point. So it's a very well argued point. And the point is, communities are broken. People now bowl alone, is the point that Putman makes. And, and that is true of one type of community, but it's not true everywhere. So Club Penguin is a, you know, is a community which is thriving. You've got thriving communities too. YouTube is a thriving community. There are many ways in which people engage. So the thing about engagement that puzzled me is, what is the difference between the communities that are breaking down Trade union membership is down in most countries in the world. Church membership is down in most countries in the world. So those institutions that are disappearing in one way, being replaced by thriving communities which feel different. So here is, here is what I think where the difference lies. And, and then I'll tell you why it really matters to you. The institutions that are disappearing, the things that we believe engage people, are fundamentally based on three things. Number one, a role. Here is your job. Your job comes with a set of rules. Here are the rules to do your job. If you do your job following the rules, you get an economic incentive. You get an incentive of some sort. That has defined most of the institutions in most of the Western world and to an extent in Asia. Okay? Do your job, follow the rules, get a reward. It's the church. You know, do your role, do it by the rules, you get eternal life, the ultimate incentive. It's trade unions, do your job, follow the rules. It's any institution you care to mention operates. And it's a lot of organizations today. It may not be exactly your organization, but it's a lot of organizations still today. Do your job, follow the rules, get the incentive. The club penguins of this world, the YouTubes of this world, the current television of this world, any kind of user-generated community of this world functions differently. It's not about the role, it's about the individual. It's about me however I tend to define myself. It's not about rules, it's about reciprocity, give and take. It's not about economic incentives, it's about social and moral obligation. I don't do it because I have to, I do it because I feel an obligation to do it. You know, in London, where I live, um, W.H. Smith sell newspaper at train stations. And in the olden days, you would look and see your train was about to leave, you would want to buy the newspaper, but there was a queue at the counter. So you made a choice, either the newspaper or my train. Now, most people used to choose the train until somebody at WH Smith thought, well, hang on a minute, what we're going to do is we're going to put a box in the middle of the shop and then we're just going to say, pay here. And then people just go and pick up the newspaper, drop their money and go. It's an honesty system. Now, if you're French, which I know you're not, but if you're French, trust me, the first thing you think about is free newspaper, right? <laughs> you think, hang on a minute. What kind, of, what kind of a country would put a system like this in place? So if you check with W.S. Smith, though, they tell you actually now we make more money out of the newspaper than we did before for two simple reasons, which many people like you probably have already worked out. Number one, now people buy the paper. They didn't before because they were trying to catch their train. So that's number one reason we sell more newspaper. Number two reason we make more money is because the vast majority of people, when they haven't got the right change, they put more money. They put a dollar, even if their, you know, their paper is less than that. So actually, the amount of people putting more money more than makes up for the amount of French tourists in London, you know, <laughs> kind of have this. So, but most people operate that way. Most organizations don't realize that if you abolish performance management, people will still perform. People perform, people obey the rules, not because the rule is in place, but because they want to live in a world where people just live together happily, where people don't steal newspapers. And you know, we've got an issue with, with economic incentives because actually in most cases, the economic incentives that we've put in place in organization destroy the moral obligation that we're trying to create for engagement. Here is the story of Charlotte. Charlotte, as you remember, is my 10-year-old, the one who can do the math test. When Charlotte was eight, she came to me, she said, Papa, I want pocket money. 
You're normal parents, you have a choice. You say yes or no. I'm not normal, I'm a leadership development person. So I think, ooh, that's a learning opportunity. That's what we leadership development people call that. So I said to Charlotte, I'll tell you what, darling, how about we try to teach you the value of money? And the way to do this is we're going to have an incentive scheme. So, darling, here is what we're going to do. I'm going to talk to colleagues I have who do executive remuneration, because we might as well go right at the top, and they're going to design the scheme for us. So, here is how the scheme works. This is a true story. You go and you see on the fridge there is a flip chart, and the flip chart says this. For brushing your hair every day, you will get 10 pence. For brushing your teeth every day, you will get 10 pence. For tidying your bedroom every day, you will get 10 pence. For doing your homework, you will get 40 pence, because the French education is more important than hygiene. So that's how we <laughs> determine the whole thing. For not shouting at your brother, which is a stretch target, you will get a pound. Okay? The thing with a stretch target is you know it's never going to happen. She's never going to meet it, but it's motivational. So you can make it as high, so she gets a pound. Okay? So we go through the whole system. It's working well. Charlotte is working her way up to her first million. And then she comes, comes Saturday, Sunday is payday. Saturday night, I'm sitting there, and I say, you know what, darling, it's all going really good this week, but your bedroom is a mess. And the deal is, if you tidy the bedroom today, you will get the extra 10 pence, which means you'll have earned everything, apart, obviously, from the stretch target, which we know you're never going to meet, but it's motivational. So, so she goes upstairs. About 15 minutes go by, not a sound. Now, if you, you've got, some of you have got kids, you know 15 minutes with no sound means trouble. Something is going on. So I go upstairs, and Charlotte kind of is in her bedroom, so I push the door open. It's still a mess. The toys are in the way. Charlotte is lying on her bed. She's painting her nails in Barbie pink. And I said, Lulu, I call her Lulu. I said, Lulu, we had a deal. The deal was you tidy your bedroom and you get 10 pence. And she looked at me and she said, Papa, I've been thinking. For 10 pence? It's not really worth it, she said. <laughs> so... I, Charlotte is currently on sale on eBay. For those, no. So I go, I, go back, I go back to the colleagues who do the incentive scheme. I said, look, you know, this doesn't work. And they said to me, and this is true, they said to me, well, you missed rule number one, rule number one of incentive scheme. Make the payout commensurate with the amount of effort. Make sure that she feels it's worth it. I don't make it 10 pence, make it 20 pence. You know, I increase the price. That may be lesson number one, but it's not the most important lesson. The most important lesson was the weekend after. The weekend after, we're getting ready to go and see Charlotte's grandparents. I said, Lulu, hurry up. We're going to see Grandma and Grandpa today. Charlotte, run down the stairs at the speed of light. Go straight to the kitchen, straight to the fridge, straight to the flip chart. Looks up and down the flip chart, shouts back. How much is it for Grandma and Grandpa? Because it's just not on there. <laughs> and that's kind of the issue. The issue is Charlotte will no longer do anything unless she's paid for it. And unless, more importantly for me, I've thought about what it is that I might want her to do next week, and then the week after, and then the week after. And I can't think that far ahead, because I just don't know what we're going to need to do. And this is the issue with organizations. We can't rely on a job description that says you're going to get paid for something that I don't yet know what it might be. So the idea is how do we build again those social and moral obligations? And that's really the last part before we go on and kind of discuss all of this. How do we create social and moral obligation? How do we create engagement again? Three ways to do this. Here are two people. Remember, we're trying to make those two people connect in some way. We're trying to get them to work on the same thing together, even though they don't have to. The first condition to creating that engagement is to create trust. That's the only way people are likely to connect, connect through trust. And the good news for us is we're wired for trust. Now, this is a, a, a brain cell. If somebody ever says to you, you only have one, at least you know it's cute, right? Um, that's a brain cell. We're wired for trust. It's very interesting. Here is an experiment which was done in the 50s back in Chicago, I think. Um, here is how it worked. Man, it was a man at the time. Man, dressed casually, stands at the light. The light says, do not cross. Okay, hands up. Man crosses anyway. People look at man going, crazy man. You're going to get run over. Okay? Then we do the experiment again. This time, man not dressed casually. This time, we put the man in a suit. Man in a suit crosses exactly the same scenario, same man this time in a suit. Crosses the line. Everybody behind the man in a suit goes, oh, man in a suit crosses. Better cross myself. 
Now, for your psychologist, well, well, what happened there? In fact, the suit increased the likelihood of people crossing the road by 350%. You were 350% more likely to follow the suit. But we know why, because we thought, well, actually, trust is rational. What happens is people are looking and they're saying, oh, man in a suit. Man in a suit, businessman. Businessman, trusted member of the community. That was 1950. Trusted <laughs> member of the community, right? When businessmen still wear men and still wore suits and were trusted. All conditions that made the impossible, impossible to do again. But man in a suit. Oh, businessman, businessman, trusted member of the community, trusted member of the community, must know what he's doing, therefore follow the man. Now, it's not quite as simple as this. Because actually trust tends to have emotions attached to it. So we don't recall the whole rational element. We actually just recall the emotion that says, oh, follow the man. So for you to kind of build the bank of trust sufficiently high for people to associate this kind of emotion to you, there's three things that you can do. Number one, become a trusted channel. Be the channel people need for information. Connect people with each other. Help people achieve. You know, do you know that you're working on the same thing as he's working and you guys haven't connected yet? You know all that. Connect people together. Be that trusty channel. Why? Because there's so much stuff going on and we don't know where to turn. If somebody becomes that trusty channel for us, we are much more likely to then want to help them when they're in need of help. Number two, be thoughtful about the way you exert influence. The trouble with too much information is also too many people wanting to help. So be thoughtful about the way you exert that influence. Am I really going to add a lot of value or just a little bit of value? Let me work until it's a lot of value before I do anything. Otherwise, I'm just going to add to the clutter of the millions of people who want to contribute, blah, blah, blah. Now, the, the reverse kind of thoughtful influence is also having concern for impact. Yeah, I'm going to be thoughtful about my influence, but I still do want to have an impact. I, I, I want to be able to say to people, this is what I'm working on. This is. So all those three dynamic together, being able to connect people in the right way, builds trust. It builds a bank of trust that enables you to spend your trust credit at some stage in the future when you need something. And it's not Machiavellian. It's not about trying to get people to do things they don't want to do. It's just about becoming that point of contact that increases this kind of social capital in your organization. Number two, once we've connected them through trust, we need to get them to work on the same thing together. How do we align their objective even though they might be separate? And that's really what I call aligning through meaning, purpose. Now, meaning on purpose can be a bit woolly and it's a big thing and, you know, what was the purpose? Here, here is one way to think about it. Three questions. Three questions that you need to ask yourself over and over again when you want to work with somebody else or when you want their help. Number one, who are we? Who are we? I know who I am. Can we talk about who you are and then can we decide who we are together? What is it that I can do or that we can do together to make each other stronger? Who are we? And that again is a weird question and it's a bit of a soft question. But it's a critical question if we want to go beyond the having to do something for somebody to working with each other, positively engaging. Who are we? Number two question, where are we going? If this is who we are, where are we going? Where can we go together? And question number three, you probably have guessed it by now, why are we going there in the first place? Who are we? Where are we going? Why are we going there? I know who I am. I think I know where I want to go. Do you know where you want to go? How can we get there together? These are the kind of discussions that we need to have if we want to start engaging with each other at a different level. Three things. There's always three things. Three things. Number one, if you want to engage in that kind of debate, you cannot have boundaries. No boundaries. And what I mean by no boundaries is it doesn't matter where it's happening in your organization. If you think you can add value, even if it's got nothing to do with it, feel free to go there. Now, here, when you have an environment like this, it makes a lot of sense. In a lot of other organizations, that's a lot harder to do. But this idea of thinking about value rather than boundaries is a critical one for you to take forward if you want to have those debates around meaning. What are we trying to do? Number two, do the groundwork. There is one thing which is horrible is when people just think some stuff is below them. You know, okay, we can do this new system and we can work on this new thing. How about you do the code and I'll come up with the ideas? And No, the people that I looked at, and my publisher is always keen on me saying we looked at a thousand leaders. 
We didn't. That's not true. We looked at 984. We couldn't quite get to 1,000, so it doesn't sound as good, apparently. But of the 984 people we look at, the most connected were doing the groundwork. They didn't mind booking the room for the meeting rather than getting somebody else to do it. They didn't mind getting involved at every level because then they could have this involvement into the purpose and into the meeting. Number three, being tenacious. Don't let go. Don't give up. You can be a pain. People will say you're a pain. That's okay. It's all right to be a good pain, you know, a worthwhile pain. <laughs> and the last bit about trying to connect with each other and being able to create this social obligation is dialogue. Now, in French, and that, that doesn't translate so good, in French we have a saying, dialogue de sourd, we call it, dialogue of the deaf, which is where everybody speaks but no one listens to anybody. That's what most organizations do when they talk about dialogue. They talk about, how am I using the point you're about to make to make my point stronger, because that's the only one I really care about. Okay? That's kind of what we call dialogue. Now, I have an easy way to remember what I call, talk about when I call about that, spam. Now, as you can tell, I have my fair share of spam over the years. The reason I use spam is not because it's the you know, most beautiful thing in the world. It's just simply it provides me with the right letters, the ones that I need. And it's not the spam you mean when you talk about spam. This is about stories, proverbs, analogies, mantras. What is it that makes you different? What is it that makes you worth being alongside? Now, again, you know, we know about the Google story. We know about the Google language. I've been on a tour today. You speak a language which just isn't mine. You talk about googly things and you talk... But what does that mean? That means that you have a community. I remember I was talking to another organization, and I said to the sales director of that organization, I love the level of engagement you have here, but there is no way I'm going to work for you because you're just weird. Yeah? You're just strange. You feel a bit like a sect, I said to him. This wasn't Google, this was somebody. I said, it feels a bit like a sect. It's very strange. And he said to me something which I thought was very profound, actually. He said, you know what, Emmanuel? If you go to a Hells Angels meeting and you're not a Hells Angels, it's just going to feel strange. But then again, if you go to an accountant's convention and you're not an accountant, it probably will feel strange too. And actually, Emmanuel, if you look at any form of community where people are genuinely engaged with each other and you're not a member of that community, it will feel strange. And that is good because it means we have a community. If it feels exactly the same as every other organization you go to and there is no difference, then we haven't got a community. We just have a place where people work. And that's the difference between the two. And you know what? If you're so strange that some clients of yours or some customers of yours feel bad about it, that's okay. They're just not meant to be in your community. But if your, your identity is strong enough, the right customers will come to belong to. So it's okay to be strange. It's okay to be different. And the way we're different is by having those stories, is by having those mantras. And for you, it means you have to do, hey, three things. The point about dialogue is always to listen first. That's my point. That's how you change a dialogue de sourd into something worth having as a conversation. You'll listen. Point number two. You see, there's something about humility. Okay, for those of you, the person you report to is 72.8% water. The people you, who, you know, we're all just that. And in fact, Richard Boyatze is uh, a good uh, ex-colleague of mine. And Richard would say to me, well, actually, it's not quite true. If you dry the cells, it's actually even more than 72.8%, which I thought was a, quite a disgusting concept. <laughs> but, but actually, we, you know, we flesh and blood water. We don't have the answers to everything. I mean, Jack Welsh used to, but he's retired now, so we really, you know, nobody now. Nobody's got all the answers to all the problems. So we're going to have to have those connections. We're going to have to build the kind of organization where people stand up and say, there is a trick in the test. And we can only do that if we've got sufficient humility to recognize that maybe we haven't got the answer. Number three, passion. How can you expect anybody else to get involved in a project you want them to be involved in if you don't care enough to have passion? And when I mean passion, I mean passion, real passion. Some of the stuff that you see when you walk into this building was driven by passion. Some of the people who did some of the amazing 20% of their time spent on some of the most amazing technologies I've ever seen, that's driven by passion. And it's that passion that we need to be able to share. You know, this is an elephant. That means remember, okay? Just so... <laughs> You know, and they always say, every speech I go to, somebody says, if there's only one thing you're going to remember, 
Okay? Now, I hope there's a lot more than one you're going to remember because I spent quite a lot of time doing that. But if there's only one, if there has to be one, then this is the one. Just ask yourself, because this is what leadership is really about. After every conversation you have, after every bit of engagement you have, just ask yourself, have I made that person stronger and more capable? If the answer is genuinely yes, then they will follow you wherever you go. Have I made that person stronger and more capable? Because that is why we follow people. You know, in the UK, they used to have an ad on TV some time ago that says nobody ever forgets their best teacher. And it's true. We never forget our best teacher. In the same way as we never forget our best boss. In the same way as we never forget our best mentor. We never forget the people who have made us stronger. And that's really all there is to the book that you have or to the talk that I've made. Can we make people stronger and more capable with a genuine intent to do just that? I want to leave you with a number, 17,155. It's a fairly big number, but numbers are all, always relative. We can make it a very small number too. And the way we make it a very small number is just by reminding you that this is approximately the average number of days you have left before you die. Now, that becomes a really, really small number when you think about, I only have about 17. Now, you're all trying to do the calculation. In the same way as you did the test, I can hear some of you going, I have slightly more than you. <laughs> Actually, I'll have a lot less than that, personally. So, but this is about the average of, of the numbers of days you have left. And the reason I want to leave you with that thought is because there was a bit of research which was done. I think it was 2003, but I couldn't find the exact date. There was a piece of research done here in the US. Over 1,000 people were being asked the question, if you could have your time again, there were 65. Age 65, they were told, if you could have your time again, what would you do differently? Over 75% of all the people asked were answered those three things. I would take time to stop and ask the big questions. I would be much more courageous, both in love and in work. And finally, I'd try to live with a purpose. I would try to make a difference. Every time I speak to anybody, I always ask the same question. Why wait? Why wait until you're 65 to turn around and do those things? I do a lot of work with clinical psychologists, and I was working with a lady called Alison. And Alison used to tell me all the time, you know, I've seen a lot of people die. I am yet to meet the first person who on their deathbed is going to turn around and say, I wish I'd had more time in the office. It just doesn't happen, unfortunately. Because the office has turned into a place where we don't fulfill our dreams. And my quest to you is, look, by tomorrow the world will probably carry on turning probabilities on our side. But there is one thing which will be different, is you'll have one day less than you had today to ask the big question. There'll only be about 17,154. So in the meantime, I hope that you do ask the big questions because a lot of us, including my two children, are relying on you to answer all their big questions. So you better be asking them. Thank you so much again for taking the time to make it today. I think we've got some time for questions. And I've been asked to point out the mic. So if you have a question, if you could put it to the mic so that people on, on YouTube and dialing it can hear. Hi, I'm Linda. I usually try to take the first question or the last question. I'll do the first one this time. Okay. Um, what do you do about the fact that people don't like to hear the truth when you are um, trying to, I don't know, something about the truth comes up for me, and uh, I'm not a shy person, so I usually like to point out the obvious, but look, people just don't want to hear it. So what do you do about that aspect of what you're you know, talking about? I, I, trust you to have the good, difficult questions. Um, now, I, I think, you know, this is, this is a, a, a critical question because... Actually, hearing the truth is really hard. I don't think people just don't like to hear it. They don't like to admit to having liked hearing it. Let me, let me kind of unpack this sentence. Um, most of us will eventually learn from somebody having told us the truth. It's just hard at the time. Now, what that means is you might be left behind as the person, and it might take five or ten years before they come back and say, you know, when you said that, uh, that was great. You've changed my life. But for those five and ten years, I just don't want to see you anywhere in the room where I'm at. And that's the danger of being the first one to ask the question, you know, is you get into that. But actually, funnily enough, people who will hear the truth will come to accept it and will get a lot of value from it. 
So the question is more, for me, where do you get the resilience to be the one to tell the truth all the time? You know, if you're giving so much of yourself away, then who is filling you back up so you've got more to give? And that's the real challenge. And it says a lot more about, you know, your support network on the people alongside you. Just to make sure, because the other thing that, you know, some of us do is we're quite deluded about our ability to see the truth. So, in, I mean, I, you know, I think I'm right most of the time because that's in my genes, right? I mean, that just, you know. I'm, I'm right. Uh, and, and, you know, so sometimes it takes somebody to say, look, you know, you think you're helping, but actually you're not helping because that's not quite the way it is. But I think it's, it's you know, the, this, this ability to grow and, and learn. So the last thing I want to say, and then I'll, I'll leave that, when you tell the truth, give somebody hope, you know, because the other thing that we all need is we all need something that we can work on. If the truth, you know, okay, Emmanuel, okay, George Clooney, right? Now give me hope, you know, explain to me how I can get there, you know? Diet might be a start, plastic surgery might be the only one. Give me a plan, you know, but help me out, you know? Don't just leave me in this limbo that says, look, Emmanuel, you know, you're not like George Clooney, which I genuinely think I am. I mean, at least the mirror tells me I am most morning. But you know, it's that. It's about how can we get that engagement so that we get some hope and we can work with the truth. Any other questions? No? Well, I think um, we have time for Manuel to, to stay up here if you want to come up one-on-one -on -one and answer some more questions. And, and thank you once again. No, thank for being you. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much.